in realizing this vision. Next item of business is consideration of business motion 11315 in the name of Joe Patrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a revision to today's business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Patrick to move motion number 11315. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11315, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. We now move to topical questions. Question number one, Mike McKenzie. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has in place to help deal with the current weather conditions. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, conditions are generally improving in the Met Office. Amber and yellow warnings that have been in place have now expired as the weather front moves south. Uh, yesterday I saw for myself the work carried out to open the A82 and I attended the Traffic uh, Scotland Control Centre at South Queen's Ferry this morning to monitor the situation across the road network and to ensure that the necessary actions were in place to reopen the roads when it was safe to do so. Both myself and Paul Wheelhouse have participated in regular SCORE meetings to coordinate the response, and the Scottish Government and its partners continue to monitor the situation closely, and the partnership approach to ongoing incidents continues. Nearly 230 millimetres, or nine inches of rain, has fallen in the North West Highlands since Friday. The A83 remains closed currently, and it's estimated that around 1,800 tonnes of material has come away from the hillside above the rest and be thankful. The old military road diversion route is being set up for use in tandem with a clear-up operation to allow people to continue to travel through Argyll and Butte, and we're confident that the OMR, Old Military Road, will be open in time for the evening peak. I am aware that some other flooding issues on roads across the country and rail travel have also been affected, and we continue to work closely with stakeholders to provide the latest information on what's happening. And I would urge the travelling public to, in the areas concerned, to use the Traffic Scotland website and Twitter feed for updates. And, Presiding Officer, our Ready for Winter campaign highlights how the public can be prepared for weather events and would encourage everyone to be as prepared as they can be, be aware of where to get help and also to look out for those nearby who may not be as able to cope with some of the extreme weather which we expect. Mike McKenzie. Thank the Minister for that answer. I'm well aware that he's not responsible for the weather. But I wonder if he could perhaps elaborate just a bit further uh, in, in, in explaining what uh, the Scottish Government are doing to deal with the landslides affecting the A83 at the Rest and Be Thankful area, particularly the Resilience Road. Minister. Uh, yes, President Officer, the uh, situation at the uh, 83, at the rest, and be thankful we have a landslip on the rest itself, which is being dealt with. Much of it was caught in the netting which has been put there, and that is going to be uh, cleared. But we also had two landslips at either end of the rest, and be thankful. So the old military road really only operates as a diversion route for the rest itself. We have landslips at both uh, Ardgarten and at Glen Kinglis, uh, both relatively small, about 20 tonnes, and those are being removed. And once those uh, areas of debris have been removed, we expect that to happen very shortly, then of course we can open the old military road pending the full clearance on the rest itself. I'm grateful for that answer and I wonder if the Minister could uh, explain how uh, he's ensuring that drivers are prepared for these kind of emergencies. Minister. Uh, well, I've mentioned already the Getting Ready for Winter uh, campaign that we launch. We launch it every year. We launched it last week. And also we're putting out information through Traffic Scotland. Plus we have a, a substantial list of individuals and organisations in Argyll and Butte that we contact whenever there's an issue at the rest and be thankful. So we've done that as well. They are also putting out information about this. And as I said, as soon as we're able to open the old military road, which we expect to happen in the next hour or so, but certainly before the evening peak, then that information will go out to drivers as well. But the usual information of Get as much information as you can about the route you intend to take. Give yourself as much time as possible and take some measures, for example, in, in your own car in terms of a blanket, a mobile phone, the things which you've said every winter before now. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Is the Minister aware of the reports in the Press and Journal this morning stating that tree felling operations in a steep bank above the 82, one mile north of Corran, contributed to one of the uh, landslides. Will the Minister speak to the Forestry Commission Scotland to review the effects of tree felling, particularly near the 82 road network? Minister. Uh, yes, I spoke to uh, the Forestry Commission yesterday when I actually visited the site where the incident had taken place. And of course, the work that's been undertaken by the Forestry Commission there is specifically designed to lessen the risk to the road. Uh, but what we have seen is a huge amount of rainfall, which has taken some tree 
uh, cuttings not piled and already complete, but tree cuttings from a substantial distance away and brought them down. So a great deal of work is going on with the Forestry Commission to minimise that risk. But the, uh, the idea that was that the trees which are there, going back to the 1930s, which perhaps haven't been managed as well as they have been in the past, have to be taken away to reduce the risk to the road. Uh, and that has been undertaken by the Forestry Commission. I've spoken to them yesterday. My colleague Paul Wheelhouse was on both the calls, and this matter is in hand. Dave Thompson. Yeah, I thank the Minister of Transport Scotland and, and, and Bear Scotland for their efforts in, in keeping our, uh, our roads open. Uh, in particular, I would like to ask the Minister, however, um, just where we are with future improvements for the, the A82. There was the route uh, improvement plan, the route action plan, and I just wonder you know, how quickly we might be moving on with that and, and how that might help in situations like this. Minister. Uh, well, we are making substantial process, uh, progress. We are committed to improving the 82, and that is, I think, demonstrated by the Crean Larrick Bypass, which will shortly be complete. Uh, the works at Poolpit Rock, which are extremely difficult works to progress, but that is being uh, scheduled for completion very soon. Uh, and in addition to that, the work on the 82 Tarbot to Inverarnon scheme is progressing well. I visited that uh, last week, uh, with ground investigations currently taking place, which will help inform the ongoing work to uh, design uh, a preferred route by next summer. Question two, Jim Hume. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to recent Audit Scotland reports on the financial management of NHS Orkney and NHS Highland in 2013-14. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government takes the publication of Section 22 reports from the Auditor General for Scotland seriously and continues to work directly with NHS Highland and NHS Orkney on the progress both boards are making towards addressing the issues raised. At no point has patient safety been compromised. All NHS health boards, including NHS Highland and NHS Orkney, met all of their financial targets for 2013-14, including breaking even on both their revenue and capital budgets for the sixth consecutive year. In addition, the Auditor General for Scotland has issued an unqualified audit opinion on all health board accounts. Jim Hume. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for that response, but Audit Scotland report states that the reasons for overspend at both NHS Highland and Orkney was down to increased spending on agency and locum staff due to problems in filling vacant medical pass posts, which is, of course, a recurring theme. There has been an increase of 73% in long-term nursing and midwifery vacancies, 103% in uh, long-term consultant vacancies just in the last two years. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that there is a widespread problem across the country in retaining and recruiting staff and that this is what is li lying at the root of boards struggling to break even and meet waiting time targets? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, while I would agree that there has been an increase in the number of vacancies, a large part of that is because of the increase in the establishment figure for both doctors and for nurses. In terms of the challenges of recruitment, particularly in remote, rural and island communities, I've many times mentioned that challenge in this House. And what I've done is implement a whole series of initiatives, including recruiting junior doctors from overseas, including giving £1.5 million to Highland Board to lead for Scotland on various initiatives in terms of uh, rural medicine, particularly aimed at recruiting new people. As the member will also know, in areas like Arnhemuchen, for example, which is part of the Highland Board area, uh, there is a particular problem in recruiting GPs. And the issue is not actually money, because the money is available for these vacancies. The issue is recruiting, for example, GPs and indeed uh, consultants in the rural hospitals because of the work-life balance they feel in terms of out-of-hours uh, working, which is often a problem. So we are uh, very well aware of the challenges. We are rising to the challenge in every possible way. But this is not unique to Scotland. It uh, is a problem being faced by rural and island communities throughout the UK. Uh, and, of course, the background to that is an overall shortage in many of the areas of expertise required by these boards. Mr Hume. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that, uh, uh, the Minister's views there, but the, there, are, there is a cost to this, and figures released in April showed a 25% increase in locum doctor costs, up to 51 million. Obviously, it would be cheaper to have someone fill those posts perma permanently. It's clear that the problems boards are having to fill in these posts is because of the intolerable pressures they're finding on their budgets. While spending on the NHS has actually increased by 4.4% in England and fallen by 
1.2 per cent here in 2009. That's why posts are going unfilled. That's why nine boards can't meet cancer targets. That's why thousands of patients continue to have their legal right to be treated within 12 weeks uh, breached. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the real mismanagement of the NHS isn't happening at board level, but here it's in Andrew's house? Officer, I've never heard as much rubbish in all my life since I last listened to a Liberal Democrat speech. The reality is, as I've said, in rural and island communities, there are major challenges with recruitment. To ensure there is the services delivered that should be delivered and delivered safely, we do from time to time recruit the locum doctors, uh, and that is costly. In fact, the cost of a locum doctor is up to 180% of the cost of a full-time doctor. The reason we can't get the full-time doctors is because it's very difficult to persuade enough of them to go and live in rural areas to get the work-life balance. And very often, one of the other problems is finding an occupation for their spouse. And very often, when we think we've filled the position, uh, it's then unfilled again because the spouse cannot find a place. So to try to reduce a complex challenge like this to silly trying to point score really doesn't do the member any good, doesn't do the debate any good. I think everybody knows the challenges the health service north and south of the border face in terms of recruiting GPs, recruiting consultants, recruiting specialists. And I think we've got to take an innovative approach. And in the longer term, we've got to increase substantially the number of doctors we train in the first place. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary recognises the specific challenges in recruitment in rural areas. He will also be aware that NHS Highland doesn't receive its full NRAC funding allocation, and he has made money available to them on a temporary basis, which they have to repay. Would it be wise maybe to roll that up to ensure they get their full allocation and therefore wouldn't be in the same financial position? Can, presiding officer, can I say to the member there are two separate issues. There's the issue of brokerage, where a health board is not going to have enough money to meet the services it needs to deliver during a year. And in line with the precedent of previous administrations, we then make money available to the health board with an agreed repayment plan. That's brokerage. That's completely separate from the NRAC arrangement. Now, in terms of NHS Highland, as with every board, we are bringing all the boards up to their NRAC allocation. And by 2016-17, every health board, including Highland, will be within 1% of their NRAC allocation. And if you look at NHS Highland's funding this year, their baseline funding is £525.2 million, which is an uplift of 3% on the previous year. That include, includes £2.5 million NRAC parity uplift. So NHS Highland uh, is getting its annual uplift of NRAC and it will, by next financial year that we're planning, 16-17, be within the 1% NRAC allocation. Again, we followed the precedent under SHARE and under the Abuffnet formula followed by the previous administration. And that is that rather than cut some boards in order to take other boards straight to an NRAC allocation, we're giving everybody an uplift, but a disproportionate uplift to those who are below their NRAC allocation. Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. I'm glad the uh, Cabinet Secretary recognised that NHS Highland did require brokerage of £2.5 million from the Scottish Government in order to break even. But can I just say, given that NHS Highland only met two of the nine targets set out on page 23, including the urgent referral to cancer treatment, uh, and given that it has to meet another £12.3 million of cuts in order to break even next year, including 10 million cuts at Rig Moore. How concerned is the Cabinet Secretary for Health that NHS, uh, patients in NHS Highland are less favourably treated than the rest of Scotland? Can I say to the member, first of all, we're not talking about cuts. There are efficiency savings, and unlike south of the border, the efficiency savings in health boards north of the border are reinvested within their respective boards. So if Highland makes efficiency savings, Highland will be the beneficiary. I do accept the particular challenges in the Highland board area, uh, and I do accept, particularly in oncology, uh, both not just in Highland, but in the whole of the north of Scotland, there is a particular challenge because of the shortage of particular types 
of a oncology consultants such as colorectal consultants. There is a dire shortage of colorectal cancer consultants uh, in the north of Scotland, indeed across the UK, but particularly in the north of Scotland. And that's why some of these targets have not been met when they should have been met. We are, as you know, advertising vigorously to recruit people to these positions so that the board, number one, can manage its budget, but number two, a even more importantly, achieve its outcomes and its targets for the benefit of patients. Neil Findlay. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentions uh, recruitment problems in remote and rural areas, but there are recru recruitment problems across every region of Scotland. And now we have Audit Scotland highlighting the financial problems at NHS Highland and Orkney. Under FOI, we found out that there has been an increase in agency staff of uh, 100% and the use of bank staff by 400 posts in the last year. And on top of that, we now have the Scottish Ambulance Stat Service ready to go on strike for the first time in 25 years. All of this before winter pressures kick in. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any plan for the NHS in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, as usual, Mr Finlay is misinformed. First of all, can I just say about bank staff? Uh, the National Health Service, like many other public services and also private industry, operate on the basis of bringing in additional staff as and when required, very similar to supply teachers in education. On average, no, they're not zero hours. On average, on average, uh, across Scotland, the percentage of nurse hours which are filled by bank nurses is of the order of 5 to 6%. I believe that's a reasonable figure for managing an organisation that performs over a million operations every year, that has over 1.7 million people attend accident and emergency every year, which employs a total of 157,000 people and which looks after its staff so that when staff are off sick, there are still people on the ward doing the job that's necessary to do. That is what bank staff do. And quite frankly, the agency budget has gone, gone down dramatically since Mr Finlay's party was in power. Because when they were in power, the agency budget was far, far higher than it is today. And we have deliberately, under both my predecessor and myself, yep. had a policy Stop and instructed days. NHS Stop boards to substantially reduce the use of agency staff, uh, which is a different issue from bank staff. And very often the bank staff are actually nurses employed by the National Health Service. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Alex Neil on an update on Ebola. The Cabinet